sing Him our praises. You know, over the last few weeks, we've looked at some of the songs of Christmas that are in the Bible, right? I mean, there's something very special about music and singing that just kind of lifts the soul, and I think that's why at Christmas time, there is so much music and song in connection with it, because singing is a way for us to respond to the mystery that somehow God came down to this earth and was born in a little baby. In songs, they tell that story at Christmas time. Now, let me just do kind of a survey here. How many of you would say that you have a bad singing voice? Raise your hand. If you think you have a bad singing voice, okay. Uh, you know, some, some people are are honest here today. Of course, you didn't have to really raise your hand. We already know who you are, but uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> how, many, how many of you here would say you have a good singing voice? Raise your hand. A good singing voice. Okay. We got one person. <laughs> But uh, we know there are more of you out there. Just remember, you know, there have been people sitting around you hearing you sing this morning. So anyway, one guy who grew up in the church, he said, I know that I have a bad singing voice because at a very early age, my parents taught me to sing a couple of different hymns. One of those hymns was Softly and Tenderly, and the other was On a Hill Far Away. (laughs) Softly and Tenderly, On a Hill Far Away. He said, I knew that I just had a bad singing voice. Well, so far this month, we have looked at songs that were sung by Mary and Zechariah. And they probably didn't have voices like Faith Hill or Josh Groban, but still they were able to put into words a song and a message that was on their heart. And this week, we're going to learn about another person who put into words the message that was on his heart, and his name is Simeon. How many of you have heard of Simeon? Okay. Simeon sings a song that is found in the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. So if you want to turn there in readiness, that's where we're going to be today. Luke, chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. Simeon, he sang a song of joy. In fact, the song he sings indicates that he was a person of joy, And so the question comes up, what does the joyful life look like? So we're going to look at Simeon's song to see what the life of joy looks like. For one thing, his song tells us that joy wholeheartedly follows the Lord. Luke 2.25 tells us this. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. Do you want a life of joy, then realize that one of the attributes of the joyful life is that it is righteous and it's devout. That means that you are obedient to God's will and and to his purposes. You're obedient in that way. Now think about how this works out in our kids' lives, just to kind of illustrate what we're talking about here. If you go away for a couple of hours to run errands maybe, and you leave your kids at home, Don't you usually give them some kind of instructions before you go? I mean, maybe you say something like, you know, I'm going to be gone for a couple of hours, but while I'm gone, I want you to clean up your room, okay? Or maybe you say something like, you know, when I get back, I want to see all the dishes done, and I want to see the counters in the kitchen cleared. And if they do that, when you get home, what's the first thing they do? They run up to you and they go, come see my room, how clean it is. They come check out the kitchen, you know, I did exactly what you said. They are excited because they have been obedient to your instructions. They've been obedient to your command. There is joy there. They want you to come and see what they've done. And when you've done what's expected, obedience, it does that. It brings joy into our life. Simeon is righteous and devout, the Bible tells us. He's a man of joy as he sings his song because he has followed the Lord all of his life. He's kept the covenant between God and humanity. And one thing that we're seeing about the people through whom God chooses to work is that they are righteous and pure. They are obedient. They're seeking to follow God. And so there's a lesson there for us. 
If you want God to choose you to do his work and to follow his purposes, if you want God to use you in a significant way, then it begins by wholeheartedly following him, right? And that in turn will lead to joy in your life. A second attribute of joy that comes out in Simeon's life song is this. Joy patiently waits on the Lord. Look at verses 25 through 28, Luke chapter 2. It says... He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Simeon just kept waiting for the Lord. He kept waiting on God. And the Bible implies that he is elderly by the time he actually meets the baby Jesus. Now, we don't know exactly how old Simeon is, If you're a teenager, you're probably thinking, oh, he must be 30 or something, you know. If you're my age, you're thinking, oh, he must be 100 or something. But one thing's for certain, Simeon has been waiting for the Lord for at least a few decades. And the Jewish people, they've been waiting on God for centuries, a number of centuries now. And think about waiting. It's not usually fun, is it? I mean, do we usually like to sit around and wait? Last week... I waited in a customer lounge for three hours while a remote starter was put on to one of our cars. Now, we had to get that car with the remote starter put on so that it could get warmed up and so the doors would open and close properly in the wintertime. Simeon had been waiting for a long, long time for the Lord to show up. But believe it or not, you know, joy can come through patience. In fact, one way of looking at patience is that you are anticipating something, right? Joy comes through anticipation. So I waited for three hours in the customer waiting room, but I anticipated getting the car back with a remote starter so that the doors would shut properly when it's cold outside. And for years, Simeon, he had been on the lookout for this gift that would come from God. It's kind of like he's checking under the Christmas tree, you know, to see if the gift is there yet that he's anticipating. And Simeon's senses are heightened. Every time he sees parents walking into the temple court and they're carrying a baby that's wrapped in blue blankets, he's thinking maybe this is the one, the Messiah that God has promised us. There are a lot of people in the month of December, believe it or not, who are looking for God to show up in their life. And all you have to do is give an invitation to them. In fact, did you know that half the time when one friend asks another friend to go to church, they say yes? It's true. Well, this week, we've got a Saturday evening Christmas Eve service. Next Sunday is Christmas Day. Each of those times of worship is going to be special in its own way. At each of those services, we have gifts that are going to be given out, made with love by very generous people here at our church. All you have to do is ask someone to join you for one or hopefully both of these worship times. And I think one of the reasons why we enjoy December so much is that we are anticipating Christmas. Half of wanting something is waiting for it, isn't it? I mean, think about this. Which gift do you most enjoy? Is it the thing that you just go to the store and you pick something up off the shelf without hardly giving it another thought? Or is it the one that you've been planning for and researching on and figuring out, how am I going to make this transpire? Simeon had been waiting on God for a long time, and he trusted in God's word, and he trusted in God's timetable. Here's the third attribute of the joy-filled life. Joy genuinely, genuinely praises the Lord. Mary and Joseph, they brought their son into the temple courts, to have him circumcised when he was eight days old, but now he's 40 days old, and his parents are dedicating him to God. Simeon is drawn to the temple courts at that exact time, at that exact place, and he just bursts out in song. Luke 2, verses 27 through 32, look at this, or listen. It says, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, 
a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. What a moment that must have been as Simeon picks up Jesus in his arms and he begins praising God. You know, think Lion King. Oh, yeah. No, here's Simeon. He's, he's picking up the baby Jesus in his arms and he's singing praises to God, talking about the past and the present and the future. And he says, okay, Lord, now that I have seen your Messiah, I am now ready to die. I have seen your salvation. Let me go in peace. What do you think Simeon thought when he heard the baby's name? They tell him this baby's name is Jesus. You know, the name Jesus means the one who saves. Complete joy is found only when God is recognized and praised. And since Jesus is the author of joy, joy comes from him. It only makes sense that we would praise him and then experience joy as a result. In fact, I would say you can't really have joy otherwise. Let's look at one last attribute about joy that we learn here from Simeon. Joy confidently trusts the Lord's plan. There's a confident trust that is rooted there. In the New Testament, we see that joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes joy is so distinctive that even non-believers can see it in believers when they're in the midst of some kind of adversity. And they have this joy that can be observed in the Christian's life and it just kind of points people to Jesus. You know, I think that points to a difference between happiness and joy. Did you realize there is a difference between happiness and joy? See, happiness is based on outside happenings and circumstances that, that come into our life. But joy is something that comes from the inside out. It's something that comes from God. And think for a moment, let's take a few moments here just to think about some of the things that can rob us of our joy if we let them. One of those things is time. Time can rob us of our joy when we're waiting a long time for something to happen and it just doesn't ever seem to take place. Maybe it's a raise you're anticipating or you're looking for a spouse or maybe you're waiting for your spouse to change or you're wanting a nicer house or you're trying to get pregnant and have a baby. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we have to wait for. And the longer we wait and nothing happens, our joy can begin to fade if we're not careful. Another thing that can rob us of our joy are mistakes. Mistakes, especially if you're a perfectionist, can take away and rob you of your joy. Our mistakes can cause us to fixate on the past rather than prepare for the future. But we have to remember, everyone makes mistakes. We, we can't take ourselves too seriously. We got to laugh sometimes and just go on. We can't sweat the, all, the, all the, uh, the small stuff. If you make a mistake, say, oops, and move on. Learn from the past. Don't live in it. Circumstances can steal your joy if you let them. Things crop up in life, don't they? And they just kind of deal you a blow. But you have to remind yourself in your heart of hearts that God is still good. And sometimes the circumstances in which we find ourselves, they lead to a difficult season in life. But that's when you have to tell yourself and remind yourself God is still on the throne. Maybe he's preparing you for something later in the next season of your life. You never know. I mean, for instance, think of Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph found himself, through no fault of his own, in prison. But then all of a sudden, through a series of God-caused events, he became second in command living in a palace. Or think of the Apostle Paul. Though he did nothing wrong, he found himself chained before or between two guards, and he was in prison. Nevertheless, he wrote these words in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. What? Rejoice. Rejoice. The secret to Paul having joy was his relationship with Jesus. A lot of things can rob us of our joy. Time, mistakes, circumstances, but even tragedy can rob us of our joy. Whether it's intentional crime or unintentional accidents, the combination of having free will and living in a fallen world, 
It can have devastating consequences on our life. You remember the ending of the Christmas story, don't you? You remember how it ends? It doesn't fit nicely with all the warm fuzziness of sipping Christmas cocoa in front of a warm fire. (laughs) The Christmas story doesn't end and fit so nicely with the singing of Silent Night at the end of a Christmas Eve service or staging a, a live nativity on Main Street downtown for our community. It doesn't fit in so nicely with Magi giving gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. In fact, the end of the Christmas story involves King Herod and his lie to the wise men when he says, go and visit this new king. Then come back and tell me where he is so I can go and worship him too. But this arrogant, maniacal king has no desire to worship this baby. His goal is to wipe out all competition to his throne, no matter how young or how innocent they may be. And so the wise men, they find Jesus, perhaps days, maybe weeks after his birth. And in Matthew 2.12, this is what it says. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. But the Christmas story doesn't end there. An angel appears to Joseph in a dream. And he tells him to get up immediately in the middle of the night. Take his family, flee to Egypt. Because Herod is searching for the child even now, and he wants to kill him. And so Mary and Joseph, they gather up Jesus. They take what they can of their earthly belongings, and they head down to Egypt, which is a long, long way off for them. Herod had been waiting for months for the Magi to return. And then one day, he realizes they aren't coming back. Matthew 2.16, this is what we read. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Herod is so brutal that he kills any child up to two years old in Bethlehem because he's not going to take any chances on some baby growing up and usurping his throne. Of course, he's totally misunderstanding the kind of king that Jesus is, but he gives the orders anyway, and his soldiers carry out this despicable slaughter. Lee Strobel, who wrote the book, The Case for Christ, he estimates that as many as 20 babies died in Bethlehem that day. 20 babies. Last Wednesday, as I watched the news before coming to Bible study at church, a story reported that it was the fourth anniversary of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, which occurred on December 14th, 2012. Do you remember that? A shooter killed six adult staff members, and the the number of children who died, 20. So I don't care whether you're talking Bethlehem or you're talking Newtown, it's heartbreaking. It's senseless. They show the pictures of those kids on TV, and I couldn't help but think of the words that we read in Matthew chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, which describes the aftermath of Herod's slaughter. Here's what it says, Matthew 2, 17 and 18. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. That's a prophecy written by Jeremiah hundreds of years before it happened in Bethlehem. And this is the kind of violence that they lived with back in that day. King Herod even murders his own sons when he feels his power is threatened by them. This is the kind of world Jesus was born into. It was dark, it was impoverished, it was full of violence. And so the real Christmas story is pretty rough. But so is our world today. You can be safe one moment... And then things quickly change in the next. That's exactly what happens in Simeon's song. After singing praises about Jesus, 
all of a sudden, what Simeon says takes a drastic, dismal turn in the last verse of his song. And the Bible says that Mary and Joseph, they marveled at Simeon and what he was saying. They were all smiles, right? They felt validated that their son was indeed the promised Messiah who was going to do all sorts of good things. And then Simeon addresses Mary very personally. And in verses 33 through 35, Luke chapter 2, it says, The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many people in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. What a strange thing to say at a baby dedication, and especially to the mom. A sword will pierce your own soul too. This is a test for Mary. Can she accept the plan of God as it unfolds, serving in this way as the mom of the Messiah? Can she trust when tragedy happens? Can she think long-term and eternal rather than short-term and temporal? Can she think about humanity rather than the child that she bore? And Simeon looks at her and he says, this isn't going to be easy. And he's preparing Mary by saying, but you can be joyful still in the face of suffering. But I want you to know, Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul too. Those words weren't words that she was expecting to hear just then. And yet 33 years later, Mary will recall and reflect on Simeon's words as she sees the Son of Man suspended between heaven and earth. She sees the horrendous death of the one she loves more than life itself. And after he dies, Mary watches as the Roman soldier takes the spear and thrusts it into his side just to make sure he's really dead. And no doubt she is thinking at that moment as any mother would, my child, I wish that was me instead of you. So Simeon has been a man of joy, singing a story of joy, even though it's not always going to be happy times. You know the irony of this is? The one thing that brings heartache to Mary and Joseph in that moment is the thing that one day will give the entire world hope. The cross of Christ, it gives the world hope. Hebrews 12, 2, it talks about the joy of Jesus that kept him going when times get tough. Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Hebrews writer, he encourages us to fix our eyes on Jesus, who endured so that we don't lose heart. What was the joy that was set before him that kept him going? I wonder. Think about this. On that first Christmas... When Jesus left heaven and he came to earth, he subordinated all of his desires because of his joy for something. For the joy set before him, he ran the race. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy that caused him to endure all of that pain? Was it a crown that kept him going? Was it authority? Was it glory? Was it having a relationship with God the Father? Was it having angels bow down before him? No. Jesus had every one of those things already in heaven. So what kept him going to continue being born on Christmas? What kept him going to continue on the cross on our behalf? The only thing he didn't already have was you and me and us. The joy set before him was us because he had everything else. He had his crown. He had authority. He had glory. He had the Father. He had angels bowing down before him. But he didn't have us. So if Jesus could love you and me like that, if you were his joy, 
I wonder if he could become your joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your goodness to us, that is the wellspring of the joy that is in our hearts and lives. And we know that sometimes the circumstances that confront us, they're, they're not pleasant, they're not good, they're not happy. And yet we can go on in joy because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We have the example of Jesus who went before us. We have Simeon who sang patiently, waiting on you, being faithful and righteous and devout every day of his life. And just recognizing your goodness in his life. May we recognize your goodness in our life this Christmas and find joy as a result of our relationship with you. May we walk this week hand in hand with you every day as Christmas Day approaches. May we honor you in our relationships, in our homes, in our work, wherever we are. We'll give you the glory and the honor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.